Hello, everyone, and welcome to Big Hunger, Challenges and Opportunities of the Current Emergency Food System, the first webinar of the newly formed Closing the Hunger Gap Network. My name is Suzanne Babb, and I am a member of the Closing the Hunger Gap leadership team. Before we get into the main content of the webinar, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about our new membership and network structure. Um, our vision for closing the hunger gap is we envision a time, excuse me, sorry, I'm just gonna move something. We envision a time when all people can determine their own futures, when nutritious food is recognized as a human right, and when there is a political will to end hunger and its root causes. We envision ourselves as part of a growing national network of collaborators and learners that engage with and support movements led by the people most impacted by hunger. And so our purpose is that Closing the Hunger Gap is a network of organizations and individuals working to expand hunger relief efforts beyond food distribution towards strategies that promote social justice and address the root causes of hunger. And we have three main goals. The first one is to build and support a grassroots effort of hunger relief organizations to shift from a charity model to a social justice model. And we wanna do this by providing trainings and resources to organizations so that they can shift their work towards social justice. We want to build a national presence to promote a collective voice of organizations and their constituents calling for food to be recognized as a human right. And we want to do this by developing a strategic communications campaign to shift the dominant narrative about how to end hunger from a charity model to social justice model. We want to build progressive leadership within Closing the Hunger Gap. We want to work regionally with our partners to support their work as they address the root causes of food insecurity and hunger. And we want to build, bring together hundreds of national leaders and advocates every two years at our Closing the Hunger Gap conference. And our last goal is to support grassroots movements led by the people most impacted by the root causes of poverty and hunger. We want to accomplish this by developing partnerships and standing in solidarity with grassroots-led anti-poverty and social justice organizations, promoting the work of these grassroots-led movements and organizations, and amplifying the voices of those who are affected by the root causes of hunger, poverty, and injustice. So one of the things that we believe is that our network should be led by the people most impacted by hunger. And in order to do that, we have created two membership structures. The first one is core members who are individuals and frontline or direct service organizations that are led by individuals who are most impacted by food insecurity, poverty, and social injustice. And the idea is that core members have greater decision-making power and that they influence the strategic direction of the network. The second category is solidarity members. And these are individuals and organizations that are in direct service, have larger resources, that focus on anti-hunger, poverty, and social justice efforts that will use their resources and privilege to help support the core members and help support the strategic um, actions that the network takes. There are several ways in which members can then become engaged within the network. The first way is through the leadership team. And we want our leadership team to be comprised of core and solidarity members. And again, core members will have larger decision-making power and will determine the strategic direction. And solidarity members are asked to acknowledge their privilege and use their resources to help undertake those priorities. We also ask that solidarity members undertake an anti-oppression, anti-racism training. The next way is through regional groups. This is something that we've heard from many of the organizations that have come to our conferences and, and partners that we've had conversations with is the ability to connect with other organizations and other folks in their regions who have common interest, who are working under similar contexts, and to have the ability to share and, and collaborate on, on actions that they can take. The next way that they can engage is through communities of practice. And these are informal networks where people come together to learn about and, and to learn and collaborate on various topics. 
And right now, Closing the Hunger Gap has two communities of practice, one on racial equity and one on client engagement. And if you sign up to be a member, you can get information about how you can be involved in those communities of practice. We also have strategic working groups, and these are the groups that carry out the actions and campaigns that are determined by the network. Right now, the strategic working group that we have going is around narrative change and really working to shift the dominant narrative around hunger and poverty. And lastly, we have the conference planning team. And this national planning team works with the conference hosts to help determine themes and conference outcomes and determine keynote speakers and workshop themes. We'll be having our next conference in 2019, and there'll be more information about that coming up in the next weeks. And as we're a new network, members, as they become involved, have the opportunity to give us ideas on new communities of practice, strategic working groups, and help to convene and facilitate those groups as well. So if you're interested in becoming a member, please join us you can visit thehungergap.org forward slash membership to sign up. And as we're rolling out membership, we thought of one of the first critical steps in creating a network is working to establish a shared understanding around the root causes of hunger and poverty. The purpose of this webinar series is to build a shared analysis among Closing the Hunger Gap members around the root causes of hunger and poverty through shared learning. Throughout the webinar series, we'll learn from an array of food systems advocates who are working for a more just and sustainable food system and are creating solutions to hunger grounded in social justice. If we are truly looking to end hunger, organizations need to take an honest look at who we are. In the Closing a Hunger Gap Statement of Values, we state that we believe in honesty and transparency. We want to recognize where we are coming from, how we are currently operating, and that we are committed to learning, evolving, and transforming. We seek to create a space that supports members in recognizing and facing uncomfortable truths in undertaking this work. And that's what we want to begin to look at today. Where we are at right now as an emergency food system and organizations, how we've gotten here, and explore some of the ways in which we are currently operating that are perpetuating hunger and poverty and may be preventing us from addressing the root causes. And we do that so that we can gain more awareness in order to begin to transform and create real solutions. Our first presenter, Andy Fisher, will help us do that. After Andy's presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. In the second portion of the webinar, we'll be joined by Robert Ojeda and Marco Liu, of the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona. We'll talk about how their food bank is shifting their work towards mobilizing resources for community organizing and supporting community-based solutions to end hunger. Once again, after their presentation, attendees will have an opportunity to ask questions. Now a few instructions about our Zoom webinar software that we're using today. All attendees are muted and will remain in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. After each presentation, we'll open it up for questions from you. At any point during the webinar, you can type a question for any of the panelists into the Q&A box, which is found at the bottom of your screen. You may also share stories or comments with the panelists and other attendees in the chat box. We will be recording today's webinar, and we'll send out a link to the video in a follow-up email after the webinar. So now, we're going to start off with a polling question. We just want to get a sense of who's in the room. So the first question is, is ending hunger part of your organization's mission statement? All right, we're going to give about five more seconds. Great. So interesting. So looking, there's about half of the, the audience's organizational mission statement includes ending hunger. I guess it's something to keep in mind as we move into our presentations. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Andy Fisher. Andy Fisher is a leading national expert on community food security. 
1994, he co-founded and led the Community Food Security Coalition, a national alliance of groups working on food access and local food until 2011. During this time, he created and publicized the concept of community food security and played a key role in building the food movement. He has played a lead role in gaining passage of numerous pieces of federal legislation, including the Community Food Projects and the Farm to School Grant Program. He has taught on ver at various universities in or Oregon and served as an interim executive director at Portland Fruit Tree Project from 2015 to 2017. His book, Big Hunger, The Unholy Alliance Between Corporate America and Anti-Hunger Groups, was published by MIT Press in 2017. He currently consults to various food systems organizations and speaks throughout North America about his vision for addressing hunger. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Suzanne. Let's see if I can figure out how to get this working. Okay, there we go. I think I got it. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I like starting with a uh, introductory quote. I couldn't figure out which one to do, so today is a twofer. So it, uh, we get two quotes uh, for the price of one. So the first one is uh, from Archbishop, uh, our Brazilian Archbishop Camera, and the second is from the playwright Oscar Wilde. So just to give a little bit of context before I get going. So I'm gonna go relatively fast because I don't have a lot of time um, and hopefully um, I don't go too fast. So I wanna start with the origins and history of food banking. I wanna start in the late 1960s uh, when we were just uh, coming off of, we're in the midst of kind of the civil rights movement and folks were pushing for a lot of anti-poverty changes and a group of uh, congressmen or congressional representatives and advocates came together and decided that they would wanted to focus on hunger. They felt that hunger was a much more saleable term to the public. It was universally immoral. So hunger became kind of the poster child of poverty. In many ways, it was very successful as we saw a lot of nutrition programs in the 70s take hold. But around the same time, um, we also saw the first food bank uh, uh, take place and uh, kind of become founded, I guess, in 1967 in Phoenix. Uh, Second Harvest, what started in the, in the 1970s to propagate that initial model. And during the 1970s, there was a handful of food banks around the country. And then food banks really, uh, really began to take hold in the early 1980s when we had a perfect storm of a, re of a recession. Uh, Ronald Reagan came into office. There were, there were cutbacks to government welfare programs, including the food stamp program. There was high unemployment rates. And in places like my hometown of Youngstown, Ohio, we saw a lot of folks, you know, were thrown, on, on, were thrown out of the factories uh, because the factories closed. We saw massive unemployment in what has now become the Rust Belt. Uh, so if you talk to those early organizers who were involved in those, in those first food banks, they will tell you that the emergency food system was not supposed to last forever. It was supposed to be a temporary stopgap to what was considered a social disaster. Uh, people would get back on their feet and things would go back to normal. You know, that's the, hence the term, the emergency food system. Um, here, but, you know, here we are 35, 40 years later. To me, the really interesting part of this is that the emergence of the emergency food system came at the same time as the development of what is now known as the Rust Belt in places like Youngstown, Dayton, Gary, Indiana, Detroit, where we saw the hollowing out of the manufacturing economy in many places that manufacturing industry, the manufacturers and the industry never came back. Uh, so those are, to me, those are very, par those are parallel trends and ones that I'll get to in a little bit about that importance. But, you know, food banks, uh, emergency food system was a response to neoliberalism. It was a response to this effort to reduce the scope of government in, in addressing hunger in the country. But in, in that response, it never challenged neoliberalism. In fact, it just reinforced it. It reinforced the idea that the private sector could take care of the hunger problem. Uh, and that has continued to the day and that has serious implications. So let's get a sense of, of the scope of, of charity these days, of the scope of the emergency food system. You now we now have about 200 food banks in the Feeding America Network. They serve 61,000 soup kitchens and food pantries, who are the kind of the community-based uh, place where people can go and get food, kind of the retail level, if you will. 
about 46 million people and about four and a half to $5 billion worth of food a year. So you can see charities become very much institutionalized in the United States. So what are, so what are the implications of that tremendous growth? Um, you know, and part of it, the first one is that food has become the answer to hunger. It's not that justice or jobs or, or to some degree, perhaps SNAP is, is the answer to hunger, but charity has become the, the, the solution in people's mind. Uh, uh, it's become inextricably linked to the solution to hunger. More, you know, you have more and more food banks that are working on advocacy around SNAP, but they put in, you know, generally as compared to their, their organizational budgets, very little effort. Um, we have, you know, food banks reinforce that message every day with their food drives and their communications and give us food and we will solve the hunger problem. We've depoliticized hunger. You know, we, we see, I see signs throughout here in Portland, uh, we, you know, attesting to the fact that we can all come together and end hunger. That's not how we got into the situation. We got into the situation because there's winners and losers. Um, and in, in saying that we can all do it and saying that corporations can be our partners, we're depoliticizing it and taking it out of the public sphere and putting it into the private sector's hands. Uh, we're take, we're, we are, again, we are depoliticizing. Uh, the next piece, the next implication is that um, the very idea of the harvest box that the, that the Trump administration has put forth is very much grounded and based in the success of the emergency food system. That, that idea would not have taken place, would not have happened if it weren't for the fact that there are thriving charities around the country that are distributing $5 billion worth of food. It, charity has become a credible, if insufficient, answer to hunger that a lot of uh, conservatives will point to as, as a rationale for why we can cut the SNAP program. So charities also laid the SNAP, the groundwork for SNAP program. Charity diverts attention away from systemic solutions. Um, the emergency food system has really harmed the dignity of the poor. Uh, Nick Saul, who wrote a great book called The Stop, talks about uh, food banks as death by a thousand cuts to the soul. We've portrayed corporations as hunger fighters, not causers, you know, in, in allowing Walmart and, and, and other corporations to come in and, and tout their role as, as partners with food banks, we've given them a pass on solving, pro on, on, on solving the hunger problem. You know, they may have very low wages that are, that are driving people to participate in the SNAP program or driving them towards food banks or actively encouraging them to, to go into both. But by touting them as partners in the program, we are not pointing our finger to them and not forcing them to, to recognize and to address uh, the inadequacies of the wages and the hostile labor conditions that they're creating. And then finally, um, Oh, so let me go back. Sorry. And finally, you know, I, and kind of, I'd love to have a, more of a conversation this about about this with with folks at a later date. But I, I like to tie this back to the 2016 elections. You know, we as a nation have provided the working class in places like Youngstown and and Gary and Dayton and Pittsburgh and Cleveland. We provided them with unpopular options, uh, SNAP and food banks, uh, as a safety net, rather than listening to them and engaging in those core. Uh, livelihood issues around bringing good jobs back, around bringing uh, good wages back, around having safe and healthy working conditions. Um, we've 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 ignored those root causes of poverty, and the blowback in my mind is, is President Trump. So, so the question for me is, you know, thirty-five to forty years later, are we stuck in a rut? You know, why do we continue to do emergency food system? What are food banks doing to foster social social change? and not just provide food. And we'll see a lot. Robert Ojeda and Marco are gonna talk a lot about uh, what they're doing in, in Tucson around this area. A number of food banks are doing some fantastic work. But how are food banks complementing their social services with social change? Um, I think the first, you know, first one to get into some of the barriers to that social change approach. What's keeping us in that rut? And the first one is the perception of work as, the perception of the, the food banking is a zero sum game. In other words, that every dollar that is dedicated to root cause work, that is dedicated to not putting, that is not dedicated away from uh, food distribution is taking money and food out of the mouths of poor people. Um, that, that is a hard argument to counter and that, that keeps us very much in that, in that cycle of we need to increase the number of pounds we distribute. We need to meet the, the immediate needs because the immediate needs is the only thing that matters. 
Um, secondly, uh, another barrier is the perception food banks have of themselves as being mainstream, rich, and respectable. You know, there's, there's a degree of self-perpetuation that, that continues with food banks, as with any nonprofit organization. You don't want to solve the problem because that threatens your organizational livelihood. Uh, so if you keep that problem going, if you treat the problem rather than solving it, you're going to keep your you're going to keep yourself going. Um, and, you know, there's also a sense that food banks maintain their respectability and don't go out on the edge because maybe that's the best way that they can solve the problem. They're a bridge. They're, they're respectable. They're someone the media can come to, that policymakers can come to, um, to use and to use their privilege for some good. Uh, Along the same lines, you know, around mainstream respectable, respectable and rich, I just put together a slide of some of the highest salaries in the emergency food system. And in, 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 in some of these uh, examples, you see, for example, the, the, the Greater Boston Food Bank CEO actually got a $90,000 bonus on a, num a number of different years uh, because, she, because, in part, she met her poundage goals. So there's, an, there's actually a financial incentive at that level to be um, pushing more food through the system rather than solving the problem. So the donor base in emergency food system, it's all across the political spectrum. If you're, if you're in a red state, you know this. Uh, and even in a blue state like Oregon or California, uh, food banks have a bipartisan coalition. They don't want to alienate their donors. In many cases, you'll, you'll see that the biggest donors to food banks are large corporations who, who, will tell their, who will tell the CEO of the food bank that if you cross this line, if you start advocating on wages, or even if you start advocating on SNAP, we're going to pull our donations from you. Uh, so food banks feel like they have to toe a line, kind of have to stay very centrist and, and stay away from controversy if they want to keep that donor base happy. And the donor base also responds to the calls around hunger rather than social justice in many cases, because that's the message that food banks have been pushing. Um, there's also a big power dynamic with food, corporate food donors um, that's meant an unwillingness to turn down food. My understanding is that Feeding America is starting to change that and starting to allow food banks, we're talking about allowing food banks not to take soda, not to take candy uh, as, uh, as a direction, you know, to give more, more power to the food banks rather than to the corporate food donors. Why am I not going down? All right, my slides are kind of spinning around. You know, I think there's, uh, so I'll keep talking. So, you know, I think there's an, a degree of unethical fundraising that can happen as well. Um, for example, Feeding America has been partnering with uh, the Cheesecake Factory, where if you buy a slice of cheesecake, you, Feeding America, gets a certain amount of money. Um, you know, to me, that's questionable. That's que those are questionable practices in the context of, of you know, diabetes and emergency um, uh, epidemic we have in the country. Um, Finally, and then boards are highly corporate. You know, I, I did research. I'm sorry I can't show the slide because uh, for some reason the, the, keep, the keep spinning. Um, it won't progress. But I did a lot of research in looking at who's on, on food bank boards, and I found that as of last year, about one quarter of the food bank board members come from Fortune 1000 companies or their private sector equivalent. So about, I forget the exact numbers, but... Uh, about 20, it was about 22%. And only two persons of across those 157 food banks that I was able to find data on for employment affiliation for board members came from a labor union. So you can see where those connections are. And then the final barrier that I, that I really want to uh, put out is that, uh, is that the way that food banks measure their success replicates distribution. Um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, we, you know, as long as food banks keep measuring their se success in terms of the pounds that they distribute and the people that they serve, um, they're going to push that. That is going to be uh, the, the indicator that, that the organization is going to be oriented to. So we need to be finding alternative, um, alternative ways of, of demonstrating our success. Thank you for getting that. Oh, so how do we change this? Um, oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So how do we change this? Um, what's my vision? So, you know, I think, you know, we need as, as individual organizations, as Robert and Marco will talk about, we need as individual organizations to be talking about what's our long-term strategic plan. How do we make food banking obsolete within 15 to 20 years? We need to be doing that as a movement. 
uh, Feeding America needs to be doing that. We need to be doing that as a nation. Be thinking about how do we get ourselves out of this rut that we've dug ourselves into over the past 30 to 5 to 40 years. Uh, we need to be moving away from poundage growth goals, not putting into our strategic plans that we intend to distribute three to five percent more food every year. Um, you know, we need to be developing sample benchmarks uh, along those lines to, to move us along that 20 year path. You know, for example, let's put 10 percent of organizational budgets into policy advocacy by 2020. Uh, and just by comparison, Oregon Food Bank uh, is the, has the largest public policy department of any food bank in the country. And it, it dedicates about six to 7% of its budget to policy. Uh, so they would need to grow by 50%. Many food banks would need to grow exponentially. And then let's put 50% of our budgets to upstream causes by 2025. Again, uh, Tucson is doing that. Um, thank you. We need a new vision for, for what anti-hunger work is if we're gonna address hunger in a different way. Uh, those, as, as Suzanne mentioned, with the closing the hunger gap, they're putting folks who are, who are, who have lived experience at the front and center of the coalition. That's a, that's extremely important. Uh, those who are most at risk of hunger should have a strong leadership role. We find that the leadership of major anti-hunger organizations tends to be people who look like me. They tend to be white males, a professional class. Food needs to be considered a human right. U.S. is the only country that has not signed on to um, UN covenants around food as a human right. Uh, food banking should be about relationships, about helping people get out of poverty, helping them uh, overcome the barriers that they face rather than just a transaction, rather than just handing them a bag of food. Uh, the highest quality of food needs to be distributed in food banks and federal food programs. We need to be using that food to promote sustainable food systems. Um, we're not gonna address hunger without addressing economic and social and racial justice injustices. Uh, so those are preconditions to ending hunger. Uh, we, it cannot be, a Band-Aid is not gonna work. Uh, corporations can partner with, with anti-hunger groups, but first and foremost, they need to, need to take care of their own employees. They need to be paying their employees living wages as a precondition to engaging with, with philanthropy. And then charity and federal food programs should be generating wealth uh, and should be generating kind of an, an, an economic democracy as well. We need to be looking at who's benefiting from charity and who's benefiting from the $85 billion we spend on federal food programs. So the last slide I wanna, I wanna talk about is, is, is uh, comes out of Scotland. Scotland has been doing a really interesting work in trying to roll back food banks in their country. Um, and they have gotten the, the federal government or the government there to agree to try to uh, make food banks obsolete. Uh, but organizations there have come upon a series have come up have come up with a series of principles that they call the dignity principles, uh, in which they're they're trying to take food food banks, food pantries, emergency food groups from where they are along the continuum to a place where they where they can offer their participants with more dignity and whether that's ultimately getting away from, from food banks or doing a better food bank. And so those four principles are you know, involving uh, in decision-making people with direct experience of food insecurity, as Suzanne talked about with closing the hunger gap, recognizing the social value of food, uh, recognizing that food brings people together, uh, giving people opportunities to contribute so they're not just recipients, but they are full participants in the process, and leaving people with a power to choose, uh, the power to choose the type of food that they, that they receive in general. So I will leave that with, leave it at that and take some questions. And, um, and as Suzanne said, uh, my book, Big Hunger, if, if you haven't seen it before, it is out and available from, from bookstores. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, before we open it up to questions, and if folks have questions again, you can go into the Q&A box and start typing those in. We're gonna pull the, uh, we're gonna pull the audience one more time with a question to ask you. And this question is about how folks who are using your services are engaged in decision-making. And you can click as many as apply to you. Mm -hmm. 
All right. I mean, interesting to see about 25% said no. Looking as you were talking about board members and who is on boards and who aren't in terms of corporations having folks on, on boards of food banks and anti-hunger organizations, there's only about 7% where people who use the services are involved in decision-making in that way. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony and Amanda, who are also members of the leadership team, um, to uh, start the Q&A process. Thank you, Suzanne, and uh, thank you, Andy, for a great presentation. Uh, our first question comes from Andrew, and he asks, uh, what changes should be made to our economic system that would help us end poverty and therefore hunger in our rich country? That's a, that's not a, a small question, is it? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, there there's a lot of places to start on that. I mean, we can take a look at, you know, at, at a small level, a kind of a basic level of of wages, of of increasing the minimum wage from the federal level of seven and a quarter to hour to something that's that's you know at a more livable level, fifteen dollars an hour as a baseline. Uh, index it to inflation, index it to productivity, uh, changing working conditions, changing labor laws that allow, uh, that, that force corporations to communicate about schedules so people are able to pull together multiple jobs if they need to, uh, changing labor laws so that folks can more easily jo join labor unions and labor unions have greater power. I mean, those are all some really basic, basic pieces. And then, you know, we get into much bigger structural issues around the, the, the pay differential between CEOs and, and workers and where is the money going and what we get into tax policy uh, about, you know, can we capture a greater percentage of corporate taxes, corporate income as taxes and, and the taxes of the wealthy uh, to pay for social programs. I mean, we can go, you know, many, many different directions, but that's just a starting point. Um, so, I saw through the Q&A that a lot of people said that the last poll um, only allowed people to choose one um, answer. So I don't know if it's possible for us to run that poll again and let um, people answer more than one thing, um, but I wanted to throw that out there. Um, and then I'll read the next question that we have submitted. Um, and it says, are there examples internationally of countries that have zero food banks? And um, they mean countries that have had them, but were able to zero them out, um, not countries that don't actually have uh, social welfare systems. I am not familiar with, with any that have been able to kind of, you know, reverse that path. Uh, Scotland is the only one that I've heard of that is actively trying to go down that, that road. It seems to be a one-way road, one-way path. And most of the OEC, I think most, if not all of the OECD countries do have food banks. So every major industrialized country uh, that I know of uh, has gone down that road. But I should just say, if I can just say the US is the one with by far the largest in, in infrastructure. Great, thank you. Uh, we Our next question uh, comes from an anonymous uh, questioner uh, who asks, what are the ways that anti-hunger organizations can fundraise to help further the movement and this shift uh, in model? So say, I'm sorry, what are the ways that food banks can fundraise? Uh, the way that anti-hunger organizations can fundraise to help further the movement and this shift from charity to solidarity. Right, you know, at, at the 20... 15 conference, Mark Winnie uh, was one of the speakers and did a, and did a great talk um, in which he had written a draft donate, a draft thank you letter uh, or a draft donation letter um, and read it out loud from the stage. And it was, it was kind of an example of how that, that typical donation letter, which talks about, you know, the sad girl who doesn't have food and how we need you to help her can really be transformed to talking about the positive changes that the food bank is doing to shorten the line. Uh, and I think that, that, that was a great example of that type of fundraising appeal um, that I know people, a lot of people got very, very excited about it. Mark said he had a great, great response to. I don't know how many food banks have, have 
gone down that path. Um, but, you know, I think that would be something to kick back out to, to, to the network to find out what is working as alternative, alternative fundraising to the kind of the basic, uh, you know, feed the need model. Okay, so the next question that we have here is, how can we ensure food insecure secure folks remain fed while we change the big problems? Also not a, not a small question. Yeah, I mean, it's a dual strategy. I mean, I certainly am not talking about, you know, let's get rid of food banks tomorrow and throw everybody, the 46 million people that are being serviced by the, by the food bank industry out of, you know, onto the streets and hungry. I mean, that would be, you know, that would be unconscionable. Um, but it's a question of how do you transition organizations bit by bit, slowly by slowly and intentionally away from that model. And, you know, again, just to kind of reference closing the hunger gap conferences at that, at the conference in Portland, uh, in, was it in 15, Nick Saul had a great comment about, you know, you need to say no to some things if you're going to say yes to others. Um, and so, you know, otherwise it will drown you. You can keep feeding people and keep trying to pump more food through the system, but that's all you're gonna do. So if you wanna move upstream, you've gotta consciously say, you know, this is what we're gonna do within that structure and, and we're gonna dedicate resources to something else. And that's where it becomes that zero sum game that I talked about. And that's where it becomes very challenging, you know, to have those conversations about who are you not gonna serve or who are you gonna serve differently and how do you define your role differently? Um, it, it, it's it's not an easy easy discussion when it involves real people. Great, thank you. And our next question is: um, Are there any ideas on how we can get more food banks involved in this conversation about long term strategy to end hunger and poverty? You know, there's. I, I keep hearing a true. I keep hearing this. I don't know if it's a cliche, but I keep hearing this. You know, basic idea that that a third of food banks are very progressive, a third of food banks are kind of on the fence, and a third are much more traditional. And it, it's been my experience in watching this field for, you know, a long time that, you know, many food banks in, in recent years are moving towards more, more root cause work. Every time I hear, I constantly hear stories about folks moving in that direction, especially around health. I mean, health that seems to be a much easier path for food banks to move down rather than economic justice, um, perhaps because of the, 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 some of the issues that I brought up earlier. Um, so I think that's a great starting point for where food banks can be. And I think the, you know, the advent of the Closing Hunger Gap Network is incredibly important um, for changing that narrative and, and creating a kind of a mutual support network for, for and discussion of best practices for how food banks can continually push the envelope to move in that direction. So another question that we have, and I think this would also be a good question for um, um, Robert and Marco later on, but what, what alternative metrics besides pounds should we be tracking and sharing with stakeholders? Yeah, I'd love to see what Robert talks about. I mean, I've seen, you know, Community Food Centers of Canada talks about, you know, health measurements. It talks about building social capital relationships, talks about political advocacy of, of, their, of the folks that they're working with. Uh, so I think that those are some, some ideas. I think a lot of food banks are, are struggling with that and trying to find alternatives. And I'd love to hear what Robert and Marco have come up with. Likewise, looking forward to the next presentation. Um, our, the next question, however, is how can we convince food bank managers and anti-hunger groups to challenge their own job security? You know, it's through their conscience, right? I mean, it's through, you know, it, it's through a, a, a matter of, you know, are you trying to, well, let me hear, here's, here, maybe here's a, here's a parallel. Here's a way to think about this. People do, um, if you're in a job training program, you're in that job training program for a defined period of time. Uh, you graduate, you move on, you get a job. That's how you measure success. That's how that job training program measures success, right? You don't think you're gonna be training people until they're 65 and they have to retire. 
the emergency food system in some ways doesn't do that. It measures its success by keeping people within the system. So the longer you keep people in that system, the more successful you are because, because you're measuring those people. So it, it's getting those folks to think about their, about defining their success and their jobs differently. Um, I'm not saying that food banks need to go away at all. I think food banks are incredibly valuable institutions and can do a lot of, lot of great work as Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona is doing and many others. But it's redefining what food banks do in, do away from just providing food to people, to providing a whole host of social services and certain services to the food system that make them very valuable players in the community development field. So the next question um, is about campus-focused hunger projects. What are your thoughts on campus-focused hunger projects and how would you go about addressing food insecurity on university campuses and among university students? Um, you know, it, it's obviously campus hunger is obviously getting a lot more attention. It's a growing problem. Uh, people are becoming more conscious of it. I think there's, you know, there's a couple different levels that, that I would jump in at. One is there's, you know, the immediate need of students that whose checkbooks are empty and their and their parent their pantries are bare and need some food to be able to continue. That's kind of a, an obvious thing that a lot of a lot of campuses are doing. Um, there's another part of it that's changing the narrative. You know, for my generation, we all grew up and we probably are replicating this as as we go along of you know of of student hunger being a rite of passage. Um, you know, we all ate ramen and we all think, well, that's just the way it is. You're a starving student and ha ha ha. That's just, you know, once you get a job in the real world, you'll be fine. Um, so we need to change that narrative. We need to help people recognize that there are real costs and implications to, to student hunger. Um, and then, you know, I think this, this kind of the student hunger projects need to be working along those lines with universities and with other players to to really change the to, to address the issues around the cost of going to school the structural issues around college education um you know college education is not just the province of the wealthy anymore i mean that is why in part why student hunger is such an issue is because you're getting working class kids or kids from working class families going into into college it's become much more democratic but at the same time the cost of college is exorbitant so universities need to be looking at how do they make the cost of going to school cheaper? How can, you know, working with, uh, as in they're doing in California, about making SNAP, uh, making students eligible for SNAP, changing the guidelines around work requirements to allow for school. And, and, and in general, you know, addressing the whole set of issues that in our country of how we see the cost of, of college and, and thinking of it as a social value, not a private good. Great. I think we only have uh, time for two more questions. Um, so our next question is, how can we change the something is better than nothing attitude of food banking? How can we change the nothing attitude of food banking? The something is better than nothing attitude. Ah, food is food kind of. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think there's a lot of folks that are going down that path, like in Santa Barbara, where they're recognizing that they're not there to produce, to distribute food. They're there to help produce health. They're there for clear health outcomes. So it's having, uh, it's educating those folks about what are the health indicators, what are the health disparities in their community among their, the people that they're serving. Uh, with regards to say diabetes or obesity or heart disease and how the food that they're that they're providing reinforces those health problems so I think it, it's you know it, it's it's a dichotomy or it's not a dichotomy it's a tension between uh, the kind of the chronic needs of hunger or the, the acute needs of hunger and the chronic health issues and 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 helping people figure out a way to balance that yes something is better than nothing in many cases but we're not providing people with emergency food, usually as a one-off, it tends to be a chronic need that people keep coming back for over the course of many years. So in doing so, you know, we need to be more responsible in terms of the types of food that we're distributing. Okay, so here's our last question for you, Andy. Um, 
Many people involved in charity related to hunger feel that this model is food, feels good, and genuinely believe that this is best, including corporate entities. What ideas or models exist to start the shift and change towards social justice? So many, so just to re-understand, many people believe that kind of the, the distributing food is a feel good, doing good model. What, what are the models to, for change? That's how I'm understanding it, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's, again, there's, you know, there's an incredible wealth of organizations around the country that are doing fantastic work. Um, many of them are probably on this call that are, that are, you know, whether they're engaged in farm to school or gardening or, or, or facilitating food access in their communities through CSAs or farmers markets or bringing new stores in, uh, or, you know, in, you know, doing great community development work as in the case of Oregon Food Bank. Um, I don't think there's any shortage of models to look at. Um, you know, and again, come have them come to a Closing the Hunger Gap conference and they will see a plethora of fantastic work. Great, thank you. Lots of great questions, good conversation, and hopefully we can continue that after our second presentation. I'd like to introduce now our next two presenters from the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona, Robert Ojeda, Chief Program Officer, and Marco Liu, Director of Advocacy and Outreach. Robert Ojeda was born and raised in Arequipa, Peru, where he grew up farming at his family's farm. He joined the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona in 2010, where he is currently Chief Program Officer. In his role, Robert oversees the Community Food Bank's programmatic initiatives, including hunger relief, community health, education, and development. Robert has over 20 years of experience doing community organizing work in Tucson and overseas. He regularly teaches community organizing and development workshops to indigenous leaders from Latin America. He is an enthusiastic soccer player and an Andean music musician. Marco Liu is a Tucson native and has attended local public schools and the University of Arizona, where he received a BA in psychology. In 2010, Marco retired from the Arizona Department of Economic Security after 30 years with the department. As a program administrator for his final seven years, Marco was responsible for overseeing the largest DES agency, including over 2,800 employees in 82 field offices, across the state in addition to several administrative support units. Marco has participated as a volunteer for numerous organizations, having served on the Community Food Bank Board from 98 to 2009. In his current position since 2010, Marco has led the Community Food Bank's advocacy and public policy work and is excited to be doing grassroots organizing with community members and institutional leaders to bring about social change. Welcome, Robert and Marco. Thank you. Thank you. Give us a second to set this up. OK, well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Andy, for your, for your uh, ideas and thoughts. A lot of uh, food for thought, for sure. Uh, we've had uh, the privilege of having Andy here, too, engaging with our folks. So um, thank you for that. What we're going to do is uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the contextual pieces uh, and then uh, some of these key moments we've had at our organization. And Mark was going to talk a little bit more about today and some of the things we're doing. Um, I mean, I've, what I've heard um, today already has to do with sort of this sense of, uh, I would say, paralysis around how you change. And so how do you move from being an organization that's heavily focused on charity to one that perhaps is uh, more balanced? Um, and that's been our challenge for the last 20 years, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a very personal issue for me. I'm bicultural, biracial, and um, often experienced the food insecurity growing up in Peru. And so it's a personal issue for me, and not wanting folks to experience perhaps the humiliation that my mom experienced when I was a kid. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our organization. We are. Uh, we used to be a mid-sized food bank, um, if you want to change. So, um, Mark, it's, it's um, okay. So, mid-sized food bank, when I started about eight years ago, I would say now we're considered to be a large food bank. So, in many ways, we live sort of uh, this paradox that, that Andy was talking about. 
when we first started 40 years ago, we used to distribute, you know, 10,000 food boxes. Now, over 200,000 food boxes. So you can, you can tell that its growth has continued. Even when we've engaged for the last 20 years in conversations around whether or not this is part of the problem or solution or what's happening. Um, uh, at the same time, over, over year over year, we've learned that, you know, for example, today, 75% of program participants have a family member with either diabetes or heart disease. And so uh, other, other data that I can give you, we're uh, an organization that has a $16 million cash budget. We're an organization that, including sort of all the in-kind and the food uh, contributions, we're over $150 million organization. And so we are now considered one of those large food banks. If you come and visit us, you know, people would say, yeah, you, this is success. Um, and so when I started uh, about eight years ago, I noticed that we, one of the things that compelled me to come to this food bank was that they were hiring an organizer. So that was interesting to me. And they were hiring. Uh, so, okay, I came on board and I saw that we had uh, programs that were uh, different and interesting, like food production education, we had farmers markets, a lot of these things that we see in like food systems work. But what I noticed that these programs were very much fringe programs, were considered, you know, uh, nice programs to have, but really the core of the work was the traditional hunger relief done in very traditional ways. And so when it comes to this question of, of paralysis and how do we start change, I really think it, it's vital, and it was vital for us to engage, and it's been eight years of this, really engage in discussions around the purpose, who benefits, um, who makes decisions. And these have been very difficult conversations inside our, our, our organization, uh, but really vital in making sure that all of us agree at the food bank on what direction we want to take. And so we've had moments where it's felt Super exciting because we've, we've talked about, you know, yes, you know, children need to eat today. Hungry kids don't want to go hungry. We don't want that. But what else can we do? But then there have been other moments where it's felt very dissonant, very challenging, very difficult because of some of the things that Andy has talked about, sort of all these pressures and forces that we face. Um, so it's been uh, exciting that way, but challenging. Uh, Marco, you want to? At, at, the, at the heart of some of these conversations has been sort of, Andy already talked about this. You know, we've, we've had a client facing piece, direct contact with clients all of these years, unlike many food banks. But the question has always been, you know, if we provide food two, three days uh, a month, and that, you know, some of these uh, programs like WIC and SNAT are supplemental, uh, and we keep seeing more and more people come, and, and what's happening is we, we become bigger and bigger to, to, to address that need that's just purely around hunger relief. Are, are we going to feed our way out of this, this issue? And so, um, so that was a challenging conversation for many, many years. Um, the exciting thing for us has been that we've been able now to engage with, I would say, the more traditional folks, food banking work here and come to the agreement as an organization, which has, to me is sort of the most vital piece, that uh, we all agree that um, all of these other programs are core programs, and that we have to be committed to those if we are serious about the well-being of, of these folks who have all kinds of issues. And, and so there have been some, some vital key pieces in our uh, 40 years that I think have significantly impacted this direction. Um, in 2012, um, so we would go to like um, conferences like the Food Security Coalition one. And back then, I was just really intrigued to see this amazing work. But there was, uh, from my perspective, little space for food banks to talk about how do we change things. Because, the, you know, from my perspective, food banks were seen as, as part of the problem and very little space or a different kind of conversation. Uh, you would go to a more traditional hunger relief or anti-hunger gatherings, and there was also very little space. And so in 2012, 
Um, and this was done intentionally for a couple of reasons. We felt, our folks here, intentionally that we needed to, to really turn the ship. Um, and to do that, we needed to have uh, an opportunity for that. And so we engaged for a year with folks throughout the country, learned about the amazing work that food banks and other organizations are doing. And we um, proposed the idea of organizing a conference in Tucson. What that did for us is that we engaged fully with all of our staff and our board members um, and, and, and many other community members in ways that really grounded and, and, and contributed to this really foundational change for us. We left the conference as a completely different organization with this commitment to really continuing to explore solutions to these two problems, that, to these two opportunities and challenges. Another thing that I think indirectly, Andy, you contributed to this, but it's the work that folks like Andy did to work with the government and trying to create opportunities for grants or other things to bring funding so that we brought some credibility to this work that has been seen as not credible. It was this nice, feel-good type work. And so what happened is when I started, we received a $15 million grant in, two, in Southern Arizona to do this kind of work through the Center for Disease Control, a, a community support prevention to work grant. And what it did is that some folks have been asking questions around assessment and other things. It was a full process of engaging with many partners in thinking about what are some opportunities in a very participatory way, but then how do we assess the impact of the work? And that also was a really essential fundamental piece that really um, and uh, contributed to this. Um, and, and so what we have today, and Marco's going to talk about this, is a really exciting time for us, where we just finished with our strategic plan. Marco will talk about that. But one of the things our board members received was this commitment, or, or, or talked about, let's say, let's put it this way, this commitment that we're going to continue to shift in meaningful ways um, our investment and, and how we prioritize our work. So right now I would say we have about 140 staff working at our food bank. I would say out of the 140, yeah, I oversee, you know, let's say half of those and in some way they're all doing either participatory engagement work, they're doing eating in hunger relief in all areas. So that's a really exciting thing that we're really committing to a process that includes those that are impacted. But it's not enough for us as an organization. So because they still have a lot of other responsibilities that have to do with like, you know, compliance and all kinds of things that can be distracting for us. So the commitment we have as an organization, which is exciting to me, is that we're moving from what we, you know, we've even looked at numbers in our budget with our senior leadership. We're still an 80-20 organization. That 80% still of our investment is, goes directly to hunger relief. So what we want to do as sort of like a, a concrete next step, which it may not be sort of that goal you had, Andy, but maybe a shorter term goal, is to move from 80-20 from to a 60-40 type organization. And so uh, Mark was going to talk about our strategic plan, but in many concrete ways, we're going to work on sort of shifting that. Um, and so that is really exciting for us that our board can now fully engage and and of course, they have questions because this other work is not as familiar. But it took for us years of meeting with folks. And the last thing I'll say, the driver of change for us was not Marco or me talking about this. It was bringing these folks with lived experience to engage with folks inside the organization. And really, it, that was the compelling piece. So I could, I could talk a million times to somebody but then I brought somebody from our organization like Flowers and Bullets in Tucson who's doing community-based work, these youth who are really passionate about their work and engage with our board. It was just really transformative. And so I think for us, the key has been how do we continue to have these um, deeper conversations, but really making sure that the voice is not necessarily us, but really those who are most impacted. And that's been really an exciting and compelling process for us. We're not there yet. There's still sort of, I, I, I see it as healthy tension, uh, but I'm excited about the opportunities. Marco will tell you about some of our programs in the context of our strategic plan and new direction, but I would say those have been some really foundational moments. And then the people that started with this 20 years ago with a little demonstration garden 
because the Hispanic families were saying, you know, we used to grow food. And so it's grown from there. And now we have over 20 programs, I would say more close to 30, that are really dedicated to providing a holistic approach to the issue. We have many challenges. And a lot of the ones that you talked about, Andy, around funding and assessment and evaluation and letting go and decentralizing and all of that. But it's really, it's been um, an interesting and exciting journey for us. Marco? I'd also like to thank the hosts for uh, inviting us today. Um, and as was, in, as was uh, said in the introduction, I was born and raised here in Tucson. And although I don't have that personal lived experience, it was very much a part of my environment and my upbringing. Um, working as a bureaucrat in a state agency that helped with uh, federal programs, including SNAP and TANF and Medicaid, um, uh, and working on the policy side, um, it was very evident early on that um, while these systems and programs were helpful and useful, there was something missing, and that, that missing was, um, was the, again, the individuals that were receiving these services didn't have a voice in how those services were delivered and what kinds of services, uh, what, what the programs needed to provide, and so forth. So early on, I could see that, um, that again, even the best intention policies that are created to help people that we want to serve are in some ways misguided if you don't have you know that voice at the table. Uh, my time here at the food bank has been very very uh, rewarding because I've been given the opportunity to bring that voice to the table to a large extent. Uh, Robert gave a little bit of background in terms of our history and a couple of pivotal times uh, including the initial uh, closing the hunger gap conference and the CPPW grant just before that as well as our, our history of um, Again, the non-core programs of uh, gardening and farmers market, supporting local producers, um, uh, youth farm project, uh, teaching youth how to be farmers and how to do, be food producers. Um, we've had a, a pretty rich history with that as well, but it always was sort of uh, the non-core uh, programs, those fringe programs, until Robert and I got here, at which time we were very lucky to be able to start moving that um, conversation a little bit more towards that, those uh, food security programs as more core and central central to our mission. Um, and in 2005, our board of directors had a, an opportunity to really change our mission statement to reflect both the, uh, the charity part of our work, but also um, the, um, the, the root cause, the root cause uh, work that we are, are doing. And so it was recognized in the formulation of a refreshed strategic plan, uh, excuse me, mission statement. Similarly, our, our vision statement changed to reflect not only the hunger relief, but the health components related to that. Um, more recently, in the last year and a half, uh, we've again had the opportunity to refresh our whole strategic plan. And I can tell you that uh, um, I would never have guessed that we would have gone this far. The, the language that we've included in our, our formal documents uh, regarding our strategic plan clearly reflect that hunger is symptomatic of poverty. And that poverty is in itself uh, symptomatic of issues of oppression, issues of um, privilege, uh, issues of poor policies, misguided policies. And so, I mean, to have that kind of language embedded in our strategic plan shows the level of commitment, but also the, the, how far we've come with regard to this organization. Um, as Robert said, we have a long way to go, and Andy was very complimentary throughout his presentation, but um, indeed we really do still have a long way to go ourselves. So um, we used um, a lot of information from external sources. We use, uh, we relied on the University of Arizona uh, Bureau of Applied Research in Anthropology, real good partners of ours. We did community conversations in our service area. We did uh, customer surveys to get input about our programs and services, and it went beyond just food security, it went, it went to issues of just what are you facing in your community? What are the important things that are, are challenging you? And from that, we identified uh, a number of common elements, and these are listed here on your slide. Uh, they include unequal access to healthy food. The issue of diet-related disease uh, is prevalent. And then um, this might not surprise some, but others might be surprised by the idea of social isolation 
uh, living in poverty, uh, experiencing food insecurity, um, are, are oftentimes uh, marginalized populations. And social isolation is a big issue and concern for those folks. And then, of course, lack of economic opportunity, which could be said is the uh, perhaps a root of all of these uh, these problems. Um, so we have had a number of programs in place, and uh, I'll just highlight a few of them. Of course, we've had the, um, our garden programs, our farmers market programs, as I said, over the years. Um, and so we've looked at um, what is the solution to those four problem areas? Well, community health is obviously at the center. And so trying to move the needle in terms of our food bank providing more nutritious food in the food that we give out, but also uh, alternative ways of accessing healthy foods. So we have uh, the garden programs. We have uh, been able to do the double up SNAP program so that people can use their SNAP benefits to access healthy foods at farmers markets which has the dual benefit of, of supporting local agriculture. And we have just a number of community health initiatives uh, in the programs that, we've, that we have. We've also looked at the lens in terms of solution to those four problem areas about community education. And community education, uh, again, through some of those very programs, uh, our garden program, we've uh, identified individuals that have come through the workshops and have learned about where their food comes from. They've developed the technical skills about how to grow and nurture food, but they also showed leadership skills. And so we've um, identified many of these garden leaders to then take over and actually teach these workshops. And so by doing this, we expand our capacity beyond the food bank staff and volunteers. We, we, we actually get the community engaged in uh, teaching each other about uh, the source of food and nutrition and issues of, um, of food security. And then um, finally, this lens of community development as a, as a solution to the four problem areas. And the community development is, is where we uh, have done a lot of things such as um, helping small food entrepreneurs uh, to get a hold on uh, perhaps uh, growing their, their small business. Uh, and through this, we've been able to provide uh, micro loans. We've been able to provide mini grants. We have um, one of our uh, founding uh, CEOs, uh, Punch Woods, many of you might know that name, a visionary of this kind of work, uh, created a, a, an endowment and it's, uh, it's investment in socially responsible investments. And we use that endowment every year to, to award a few, a handful of small grants to food entrepreneurs to help them in, in, uh, in this way. Um, but, um, but the main thing that I want to talk about is our shift this year to um, grassroots community organizing. Now, in my position, I've done a lot of work um, with the grass tops uh, advocacy and policy in terms of making sure that the farm bill reflects, um, you know, support for these, these important USDA programs. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to find funding at our state legislature for our double, double up uh, SNAP program and these kinds of things. But um, as Andy said, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a 10% uh, investment in our advocacy and policy work. So what we decided to do is really focus on the grassroots organizing. And what we're doing with that is uh, kind of taking our own um, merger of a couple of best practices in the organizing world. And uh, we, we call it radical organizing, but it's really taking some IAF, um, International Areas Foundation organizing, and issues organizing, or community-based organizing, and kind of taking the best of both worlds to engage the public and engage those in our communities uh, in terms of um, building their individual voice and power and having an exchange of power with both funders, elected officials, uh, members of board, boards of directors so that so that the people that we're serving actually have a voice in in, in um, addressing the challenges that they face uh, prioritizing what those challenges are and and coming up with the solutions and as a as an institution the community food bank as Robert said we're a 115 million dollar organization um, you know we have to own up to the way we deliver our services and we have to we have to be vulnerable to be able to say, you know, 
to those that we serve, you know, what, what do you think about our, our benefits and services? How do you think they should be shaped? What's important to you? Um, and so it's, it's kind of arrogant to think any of us should be in the position to make those decisions without that voice. It really is arrogant. And so um, we're testing our board of directors a little bit because, um, you know, you do have individuals that are, in, that are uh, concerned about mission creep. You know, we're here to provide uh, food assistance and to end hunger. Why are we talking about justice? Why are we talking about um, privilege? Uh, why are we talking about racism? Because while those are the things that are, are um, root cause factors in hunger and, and, and poverty. And so um, we're moving the needle slowly. As Robert said, we're, we're, um, we're shifting away from those traditional measures of poundage and adding more measures of um, you know, community engagement. How many people are, um, are involved in civic engagement? You know, we're pushing the uh, voter registration and get out the vote and uh, having meetings with local officials bringing individuals with lived experience to those meetings and not just us as advocates or representatives of institutions. Um, so um, it's very exciting. We, are, we have a core group of staff that are um, work, doing this work. We hope that at the end of next year, we can perhaps double that investment and, and really um, continue down the path of, uh, of uh, grassroots organizing. Um, this particular screen, hopefully you can see it, is, a, is really a continuum um, of uh, where our food bank has been. And it starts with food security and the emergency assistance model. Uh, we do have programs for um, uh, meal sites, soup kitchens and pantries. We do have child nutrition programs, these traditional you know, backpack and after school meals programs. Um, SNAP education and SNAP enrollment, we participate in that. We've really, really expanded our institutional partnerships, not in terms of the number of partners, but in how we engage with our partners. Um, we have created, for example, a partner advisory council. And so again, it's not just us making the decisions and telling our partners how things are gonna go, but getting their voice to the table because they're, they're serving individuals at, at the level of the community. Farmers markets, um, our food production programs, gardening and farming, uh, very much leaning into our health and nutrition. Uh, and then we do have a culinary training program where we target um, uh, low income and individuals that have had uh, some, you know, some poor track records in terms of uh, uh, challenges of their own, you know, perhaps substance abuse or, or some criminal background. And we're trying to give them an opportunity to, to learn a skill that will be sellable and uh, will help them get into the workforce. And then at the end here, as we're talking about uh, promoting um, the voice of individual, individuals that we serve, uh, advocating with and not for um, the, the folks that we're, that we're serving. Um, and so that's kind of the continuum um, slide. And uh, Robert wants to jump in, but just to give you an example of one of our programs, we have a, a a small area at the edge of our, our community called, uh, 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 it's on the other side of the Santa Cruz River. And this is a county owned space, but um, uh, we were given an opportunity to use that space for a community development. And uh, it was called Las Milpitas, which is a, a, a term um, that the community named. And this was a space that was created uh, for the community that's low income in this area to be able to uh, uh, make it a community space. And so we held a lot of um, listening sessions. We got the community engaged in owning this space. And it was really, we, we coordinated it. We created the opportunity for um, conversation, but, but it was really the community that decided how they wanted to use the space. And so the space was turned into a community garden space and it's very much uh, community owned. We support it in terms of technology and, and, and education and information, but the community actually maintains the space. Um, there are some shade structures and things like that, so it's not just a space to grow food, but it's actually a space for the community to come together and, uh, and be a community, talk about the challenges that they have and, and uh, 
how to engage in, in making making those changes. Uh, I would add, Marco, to that. That to me, the exciting part about this is I'll give you an example of this woman, Panchita, that was one of those folks from the neighborhood who got excited about the farm and the space, who became part of this advisory team and decided that she wanted to run and be a, a member of the neighborhood association. So she learned how to do that. She had the support. She had the training on how to participate effectively in community and actually became the president of the association. Panchita had limited English, spoke Spanish. And I, I ran into her recently, and she told me she was going to celebrate because she had was able to leverage $300,000 from the county government for community projects. And so to me, that's an example of like, you know, with a little investment that goes beyond sort of like this sort of instrumental traditional type skill sets that we think people need. If we work with people on how to engage in their communities effectively, working on how to develop the power and the practice to engage with those who hold control, that they can be very successful if they choose to do that. So that's exciting. And the other thing I wanted to add, what's exciting about our strategic plan to me is that there are three areas that are major focus among, among others. One of them is like this, decentralizing of our network. And so most food banks, I would say, have strong networks, but we're at the center of it. And so our, our vision is that we're going to really let go of some of that power and control as a network and invest in our partners, not just around hunger relief, but other things. So that's exciting. The other really important one is, has to do with our health initiatives work. We have a, a, a nutrition policy. We have a, a team that's working on all this stuff now. And it's a really exciting opportunity. The other one is, is our community organizing work, which from my perspective is an, an evolution of the participatory development work that we did for years that gave us some credibility. And we used all of these examples and stories from those communities that really leveraged and built, a, it gave us some of that sort of capacity to then say, we're ready to really explore what this other kind of work looks like. I think there might be some time for questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, we have tons of questions um, for you all, and as well as questions left over from Andy. And just to let you all know, we know we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but this is just the beginning of a conversation. We'll have future webinars, and these kinds of questions will continue to come up. So there'll definitely be opportunity to get those questions answered. Great, thank you, uh, Robert. Thank you, Marco. Um, great presentation, really inspiring work. Um, our first question is, um, I work in a food bank that has some of the fringe programs that you talked about. Some of my colleagues seem upset that we have somehow shifted organizational resources from our food banking programming to other food systems programs. What kind of discussions did you have in your organization to shift the staff mindset? And are there any uh, discussion prompts that you can sh uh, share that help move the food bank uh, in that direction? Well, from my perspective, a lot of the questions had to do when I started here that there was no impact, really. What's the, what's the impact of this work beyond sort of like, a, um, you know, having a, an opportunity for people to get together? And so part of what we did back then was partner with different departments at the university to really try to bring some of that sort of credibility that was asked. Um, and so one of our key partners, Marco mentioned, was this uh, the folks from the, the anthropology at the university who did many, many food ethnographies and captured really, in, an, in essence, a community members' um, responses to what success looks like. And it was really sort of the shift and engaging around that, that that people were saying, well, success doesn't look like that. One of the interesting things for us, we had a, this survey that, we, that goes out to all of our partners. And, you know, we try to make it a little more meaningful and relevant. And we started hearing from folks, and, we, and folks were surprised at the time, that, you know, yeah, we're not, a, we're not happy with the partnership with the food bank. So we started bringing all of that information, like, and really having conversations. Well, you know, folks are saying they're not happy with the partnership. They're getting tons of food. Why don't we go back and engage with them and have these conversations around that? And so I think it, it, the community became our best partner 
in making sure that there was accountability to uh, to our partners and community and staff started really engaging in these conversations. We brought people like Andy. We spent years bringing these it became really a space for bringing folks also from our community here and having all these conversations. Um, and I, I think uh, sort of the combination of like some of that assessment and some creative ways that we talked about, you know, what is the impact of a home garden? We measured a home garden. Uh, we, for example, had students from the university look at it over a year or two, and then look at the value of the production and look at sort of the, the nutritional value, but also just the real value. If you had to go to a Whole Foods or a Trader Joe's and buy, buy organic, what does this mean in real concrete ways? So we did a lot of work of really trying to have a different kind of conversation. Um, and then, you know, engaging with our decision makers um, also helped that way, I think. But we still have some of those interesting challenges today. It hasn't gone away fully. Uh, so the next question that we have is um, about your garden programs. It says, how do you integrate a garden into your programming? Does it serve more as a demonstration garden for job development? Or do you see a garden as a viable solution for sourcing fresh produce for, for the pantry? Go ahead. I, I can give my perspective and then Robert can as well. Um, so the, we do have a demonstration garden uh, here on site at our main location. And this is more an educational space, uh, really to teach people how they can grow food in the desert southwest. A lot of people from the, from the, from the northeast and the midwest that relocate to sunny Tucson, uh, they look at this really, uh, this really poor soil and think there's nothing that could grow except cactus. So we actually show how you can grow food year round in Tucson. Through, uh, through different practices. Some of them are very, very ancient, you know, um, practices that have uh, been handed down for centuries. But also, you know, we have a great university here and we have a lot of resources and really some smart staff that, uh, that know about how to do this. Um, <clears throat> we, we, so it's more an educational space, but, uh, but through that, we teach people that um, they can grow to supplement their own food needs and their family's food needs. But so often they grow to excess. And again, any of you that have ever gardened know that uh, when the harvest comes, it comes all at once, uh, seemingly. And so sometimes you have more than you can, you know, you get an abundance. And so through our farmer's market, we're able to allow those individuals to consign some of their extra produce. And so it's a way to generate some income as well. Um, and um, the Las Mulpita space where we showed the, the photograph, um, it's a little bit different. These are these are plots that each community member is able to sign up for, and uh, we actually have a kind of a rigorous um, application process because we don't want people to to come in and and plant the seeds and then walk away and thinking that in three months they can come back and harvest. There's a lot of work and there's a lot of process that's involved, and so we we ask them to make a commitment, and uh, it's a process. But um, even in that space. Food production is just a small part of it. Um, it's really an opportunity for the community to come together in community, share stories, uh, talk about their hardships and their challenges, uh, be engaged, uh, and hopefully through our staff support and volunteer support, ha have those folks become more civ uh, civically and community engaged so that, uh, so that they can learn how to exchange their power with decision makers at City Hall or at the county board, um, or at the school district, or whatever it might be. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'm getting to the question. But it, I think you did. But one thing I'd like to add, one of our biggest successes from my perspective has been the, the train the trainer piece, and that now we have, you know, we, we serve 200,000 folks in our service area. And so the, the challenge we had back then from folks was like, okay, you, you're helping 100 people a year with their gardens. And, you know, again, this, this question around impact. And so one of the things we really heavily invested in sort of training others. And one interesting thing that uh, Michael McDonald, our CEO, and I were looking at our, our personnel costs 
Um, and one of the shifts we've seen, although we have 140 staff, over the last, let's say, five years, the percentage has, has uh, decreased of our budget that, that, um, overall. And what's increased, interestingly enough, is the, the, the budget that's for like uh, outside services and consultants. And many of those outside services and consultants are people who we train, who have become uh, really expert in some in different things like water harvesting, for example. And now they're you know partnering with us in different ways. So it's, it's become an engine for opportunities for these folks. And for example, one of the things we have today, we have a, a water harvesting cooperative that we start. We're starting a, a social enterprise where we're incubating sort of like a supporting community-based organizations that become, uh, so they get uh, water harvesting businesses going. That's helpful in the Southwest. And so with the idea that then we transition out of that and they become the ones managing these enterprises. We have a producer's brokerage with, that we work with, uh, with uh, school districts, with hospitals. And the idea is that we, you know, we took the risk. We have all the facilities and all the resources but in a few years, we're transitioning out of that role, and it's going to be these community partners who are going to own this brokerage. And so, um, so to me, that's really exciting that, you know, and gardening, which started with, like, education, and, and it's still a really relevant, important thing. We work in many, many schools with school gardens, for example, has now become uh, a really a resource to train community leaders to do from policy work to all kinds of other community-based work, which is really exciting for us. I'm so sorry, Robert, but I'm gonna have to interrupt us. We've got about two minutes left, but clearly we have to have another webinar with you all on. Um, and there's lots of great other organizations that are doing really great work that we hope to pro profile going forward. So thank you everyone for joining the webinar. And I know that there were also questions that folks had about the network as well. And we're gonna think about ways in which we can get some of these questions addressed maybe in uh, the follow-up email that we're going to send with the recording of the webinar as well as an evaluation form that we hope you'll fill out that will help us um, decide what the future webinar should be around. So thank you once again. Thanks to Andy and Marco and Robert for joining us today and we hope to look forward to seeing all of you soon and again if you want to join the network you go to thehungergap.org forward slash membership. Thank you everyone.